Hey there, how's it going? So you have agreed to coach an Odyssey of the Mind team. Congratulations. Some of you have coached an Odyssey of the Mind team before and might just be looking for some new ideas. Others are doing it for the first time and might be panicked a little bit inside about being in charge of a program where there are students involved and students' parents and maybe some school administrators and just hoping and praying that you know what you're doing. I understand. Uh, doing Odyssey of the Mind, even trying to explain Odyssey of the Mind is pretty difficult to do because it is a pretty comprehensive program. Uh, I often say to people, you know what, just do it for a year and you'll learn so much in that first year that when you come back in year two, you'll feel like a genius. But that doesn't really help people in the first year calm their nerves. So what we wanted to do in Illinois was create a fun coach training that will help you understand what the expectations are of you as a coach and also give you some tips and tricks and pointers that will help you be a, a really good coach compared to those people that don't see this presentation. Uh, the other thing is this year we've decided to put most of our training online. Uh, this is deliberate because if we didn't do it online, it would require that you, our volunteer, would have to travel across the state, maybe if we're doing a coach training in Chicago or Peoria or Belleville. Uh, and this way, this convenient way, you can sit at home in your favorite comfiest robe, sip it on some coffee or some tea or some Diet Dr. Pepper, whatever floats your boat, and just relax and casually listen to this coach training uh, at your leisure. You can take it to the gym with you, take it to the hot tub, uh, go on a long walk, whatever works for you. But the idea here is we're trying to make it as convenient as possible because uh, you're volu volunteering your time, we're volunteering our time, and we know you're busy. So hopefully this will help you uh, help these children and students participate in what truly is a life-changing program. So don't forget that. It's an amazing program. Otherwise, we wouldn't be volunteering our time. So uh, with that said, if you know me, hi, good to see you again. Uh, uh, if you don't know me, that's totally fine. You'll meet me soon. Uh, I'm Jim Mori. I am a 10-year competitor uh, in Odyssey of the Mind. And since then, I have been judging. I've coached for several years when I was at university. And then I've been judging at the uh, state and international level as well as organizing for, let's just say, longer than I competed. Right? We need to get into age. But uh, for a while, let's just say. So having the perspective of being a competitor and also a coach and now a coordinator and judge and volunteer, I can speak to the program from a variety of different angles and really answer just about any question you have. So uh, think of this both as a general direction for what you should do as a coach and how you should think about things, uh, but also some tips and tricks and insights from somebody who's been involved in the program a very long time uh, that I think will help you as you coach this year. So that said, let's go ahead and get started with Illinois Odyssey of the Mind, Five Secrets to Becoming a Great Coach. Uh, and also, by the way, it doesn't matter if you live in Illinois or maybe you're living, I don't know, New York or Nebraska or Germany, who knows? Uh, a coach in Odyssey is a coach in Odyssey. So our friends from far and wide, hopefully you can get some value out of this as well. I just made this for our Illinois coaches and uh, I'm sharing it with the rest of you. So. Here's a fun little acronym I have for our presentation. So we're gonna talk about your main role as a coach. So the biggest thing is coordinating your team and keeping them on track to make sure they're ready for competition. Uh, you also have the responsibility of orienting teams to the program. So what is spontaneous, AKA Sponto? What does style mean? What are the rules of the program and how do you find them? Uh, how do you as a coach ask the right questions of the team? So you're not involved in solving the problem and we'll talk specifically about that in just a minute. But how do you ask the team the right questions to kind of keep them on the right path to coming up with the best possible solution that they can come up with? Uh, also, communicating with parents, schools, Odyssey of the Mind, headquarters. There may be a situation, however your program is set up, where you are both the coordinator of the program and a coach for your team. That happens a lot, particularly in places where uh, it's a community group or a single team that's competing in a school district. Totally fine. We'll talk about what the different audiences are and different partners that you might be able to communicate with uh, throughout the year. In other cases, there's a coordinator that oversees the program and you might just be a coach of one team under that coordinator. In those cases, it's typically the case that the coordinator will be the one communicating with the school and with Odyssey headquarters. So you don't have to worry about that so much, but we can talk about that when we get there in the presentation. Uh, and then finally, just a friendly reminder, you just get to keep your hands off the solution. Uh, this may seem like a limitation, but we'll talk about how it's not at all a limitation. And if anything, it's like a refreshing drink on the beach. It's a pretty good rule for you. So we'll talk about it in just a couple minutes. So let's start with this idea of coordinating the team and keeping them on track. Now, before you do anything, like even like press pause on this presentation after I'm done talking about this particular section, the first thing you wanna do 
is make sure that you, your school, your community group, whoever's coordinating the program for your team has registered with Creative Competitions Incorporated. That's what CCI stands for. Uh, they are the main group that sponsors, that created and sponsors the Out of the Mind School program. So all you gotta do, it's pretty straightforward, is go to www.odysseyofthemind.com and just go to the join now section or the membership membership section and make sure your team is registered. Uh, now here's the cool bit of information about registering a team in Odyssey of the Mind or registering a, a school district is you are permitted with one membership to enter a team in each problem and each division. Now, you might not know what problems and divisions are yet, so don't worry, I'm with you. So each year, Odyssey of the Mind puts out five long-term problems, including a six primary problem for kids uh, kindergarten through second, second grade. But the five main problems each year include a vehicle, a technical, a classical, a structural, and a theatrical problem. Teams ch typically choose one of those problems to solve for the year. So if a membership allows you to put a team in each of those problems, that's five teams, right, right there. And because we have different age divisions so that grade school kids only compete against grade school kids, high school kids only compete against other high school kids, uh, we have age divisions like division one, which is elementary school, division two, which is junior high, division three is high school, and division four is college and university. So let's say your school district runs from uh, second grade through 12th grade. Right, So you've got the whole gamut of grade school, middle school, and high school. And there are five problems, right? the five long-term problems. So that's 15 possible teams you can have under one membership times seven, which is the number of students that can be on each team. So long story short, if you divide the membership costs, which has stayed the same at $135 over that many students, it turns out that Odyssey of the Mind is like a steal. It's a great program because the per pupil cost, per pupil cost, excuse me, uh, for schools is so low that you're like, well, just give me the program for free. So just keep that in mind. Uh, a lot of times when coaches or uh, parents try to introduce the program to a school district, they panic because schools, of course, these days are like, we don't have any money. The cool thing about Odyssey of the Mind is that it's a really affordable program for school districts to do, and a ton of students can participate under one membership. The goal is not to make money. The goal is to have students have the opportunity to do creative problem solving. So that's my soapbox on that. Um, but the other thing is you need to make sure your, your state, province, or country knows that you're competing at their tournament. So the simplest way to do that is just go to your state or province's uh, website. So in Illinois, that would be illinoisodyssey.org. If you go to the Odyssey of the Mind main page, odysseyofthemind.com, you can access your local association's uh, website and just look online and see what you have to do to let them know that you're coming. Sometimes it's an email, sometimes there's a form to fill out. Uh, there's communication that happens between headquarters and each association anyway, but just make sure that your state or province knows that you're coming to the tournament. Uh, there might be a small registration fee for that tournament to cover the cost of trophies, things like that, but again, super negligible. And if there's really ever a cost issue, just let them know and they'll probably work with you on it. So. That is, the, before you do anything, make sure you do that. So if you haven't done it yet, we're gonna pause. You go do it right now. Don't lie to me, just go do it, all right? Okay, and we're back. All right, so after you make sure you have your registration, you your membership life is good to go. Now what you wanna do is, Figure out your scheduling, meeting times, and expectations with prospective students that are going to participate. So by now, hopefully you've talked to other parents or students, uh, administrators, about building the program at your school or in your community, and you have other people who are interested because that's important. Uh, in Odyssey of the Mind, it's a team program, right? So you can have a team of two people if you want. Uh, some people compete at World Finals as a single individual, not often, but it happens. Uh, however, most teams have the five to seven people that you typically see at World Finals. And, and in fact, most teams have all seven members on the team. Teams are allowed to have up to seven members. So what you need to do is communicate this upfront that Odyssey of the Mind is not like other school programs. It's pretty much one of a kind uh, in both the content, right? In terms of its steam and creative problem solving. It's been around since 1979. It was way ahead of the game when it comes to steam education. So it's got some experience. It's, you know, a the best around. But the second thing is that it's more like a sport than it is, I don't know, like student council where you're meeting once a week in the morning to plan a dance using balloons and, you know, cheap party decorations. So Odyssey of the Mind is different in that regard because you might meet multiple times a week. You might meet on the weekends. It just depends, right? And different teams do it different ways. So just so you know, the new problems come out each year. So the Odyssey of the Mind year starts in September. It coincides with the typical academic school year. That's when the headquarters releases the new problems from which the teams will choose one to solve for that whole year, right? They just have one problem for that year. 
Uh, some teams get started right away. So they'll start in September and start meeting immediately and solving their problem. Some teams wait until January, that's what my team used to do, and they get started then. Most competitions will start around February or March of the academic year. Uh, in some larger associations, that is a regional competition. If you qualify at regional, of course, you make it to state. State competitions tend to be in March or April. And then, of course, if you win at state, you advance to the world finals, which is an international competition that will blow your mind. Uh, for some states, some smaller associations, there is no, there are no regional competitions. There's just a state competition, right? So that tends to happen again, like March, April. And then if you advance, you go to world finals from there. But just know that no two teams do it the same way. Some teams will start meeting in September and keep meeting all the way up through March or February, whenever the first competition is. Uh, other teams will start in January and they will you know, meet until they have to compete in February, March, or April. So you get to decide how that works for you. And just know that as you get closer to competition, uh, the frequency of those meetings may go up, right? So if you don't have your stuff finished and competition is just a few weeks away, you might need to call uh, more meetings. Now, when and where you meet is completely up to you. A lot of schools are super kind and they'll provide space and even storage space for the team's props and backdrops and costumes. Uh, other schools, not so much. Uh, or if it's a community organization like a library or a Lions Club, uh, that changes things too because they don't have the physical space, but they will sponsor the team and pay for the membership. So a lot of times it could be the basement of a kind parent. Uh, it's, it's really up to the team and the availability of, of the resources that you have. But in terms of scheduling your team meetings and how frequently you want to meet, that's something that uh, the team should work on because part of the program is teaching them these sort of life skills for planning. But hey, you're busy and you're the coach. So uh, you can be involved in that. There's no weird outside assistance. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, rule when it comes to you helping create a timeline of meetings, right? Because logistics are important for both you and the team. So from there, uh, you also want to check and just make sure that the team members that are going to compete are free for the competition weekend for your local state or regional competitions and also world finals just so that they can be sure that they'll be able to attend because if they can't show up to any of those things then there's probably no point uh, or lesser of a point like less of a point of them competing if they can't actually participate in the competition uh, it's not unheard of that team members help solve the problem and then if they have a soccer tournament or a band thing can't make it to competition the other team members represent them totally fine uh, but just be aware that you know competition is a big deal and if at all possible it's great if all the team members can be there to compete the other thing you might want to keep track of is just rules regarding the number of missed meetings, uh, rules while you're at meetings, right? So rules, rules, rules. But doing a lot of upfront planning on this will actually help you prevent problems later, which is great, particularly as a coach and when you're dealing with other parents. Um, Something that I suggest is that teams have a team contract that both the students and the parents sign just so that all the expectations about meeting times and behavior at meetings, all those things is taken care of. This is not uncommon for a student organization, uh, but again, you'll, you'd will you rather do it now than forget about it and think, oh, you know what would have been nice as a team contract. So that's your friendly Jim Mori reminder right now. Okay, so in terms of the timeline of progress, First thing you want to do is, uh, you know, meet the students, explain what the program is. There's lots of YouTube videos showing Odyssey of the Mind, like what it is, how it works. Arm & Hammer is a sponsor now. And they have cool videos kind of explaining how Odyssey of the Mind works. Uh, so have a look online for what you can see would resonate with, you know, your particular students or the parents in your area uh, and show them so they have some sort of interest in the program. As I said, describing Odyssey of the Mind can be kind of complicated because it's a pretty comprehensive program. Uh, but the big picture is it's a, an academic year long program that focuses on creative problem solving and divergent thinking. And the way that it does that is it releases five long term problems every year, including a primary problem, which is the sixth problem for young young omers, as we say. Uh, and each of those long-term problems has a specific category, right? So there's vehicular, technical, classical, structural, and theatrical. So the teams will choose one of those problems to solve and then work on solving that pro problem for the whole academic year. Uh, so it's not like you're having to like build a vehicle and also like build a structure. No, like your team chooses one problem and that's what they work on from September if they want all the way through May at World Finals. That's how it goes. Uh, in addition to the long-term problem, there's a component called style. We'll cover these things in a second. And another component called spontaneous. So those are sort of the three core elements of the program. Uh, and just so you know what things look like, I can show you right here. Uh, these are what the long-term problems look like, right? So here's your vehicle problem for this year, technical problem, your classical problem, structural problem, and also your theatrical problem. Now, each problem has the same 
structure. So if you look here, the vehicle problem it has a little introduction, it explains what the problem is, and then it gives limitations. So the belief in Odyssey of the Mind is, hey, teams, we're going to give you a problem that needs to be solved right here, and then you're free to solve it however you want with just a couple limitations of what must be included or what must not be included. This actually coincides with academic research on creativity that says if you're given some limitations uh, that you become more creative than if you're given a blank slate. So we know this to be true in the world of creativity. So this is what we're teaching the students. So here are all the limitations that they have. We'll talk a little bit about what the site will look up the day of competition. And then importantly, you have this section called scoring. We're gonna cover this in just a minute, but the day of competition, when they perform their solution to this problem up here, Oops, this problem, keeping in mind these limitations, uh, the judges will have a rubric in front of them that looks strangely like this, because this is how they're going to score the teams that day based on their solution. Uh, there are some penalties. We can talk about that, but they're pretty straightforward, like don't spend too much money, uh, don't go over the time limit, things like that. And then there's this element called style, which we'll also discuss. But that's pretty much it. It's pretty open-ended. Uh, and you'll see that whether it's the vehicle problem or the classics problem, same thing, right? So here's the problem for classics. Here are the limitations of what must be included or what must not be included. So you have your limitations. Here's what the competition site will look like. And then here's how they're going to be scored, right? That's how it works for all the problems. Uh, so what you want to do is make sure your students are sort of intimately familiar with these uh, problems and they know what's expected. The parents can also read them as well just so that they know what's going on. The other thing you want to make sure that they know is this is kind of the typical timeline. You're going to read the problem whenever you decide to start, whether that's September or January, and you're going to brainstorm. You're going to say, okay, well, here's the problem. What kind of solutions could we, we have? Discuss those solutions. The team's going to work to select their solution, and then they're going to create it, right, which involves writing a sketch, uh, building a structure if it's the structure problem, building a vehicle if it's the vehicle problem, and then they're just going to practice because every team has to perform an eight-minute skit in addition to, say, they build a vehicle that's doing certain tasks. They're still a skit that's going on while the vehicle is doing those tasks. Otherwise, it might be a little boring. So uh, that's what I mean by practice the solution. You want to make sure your vehicle works. Uh, you want to make sure your structure holds weight. And if it doesn't uh, hold weight or if the vehicle doesn't work, then you have time to tweak it or fix it. Uh, maybe you're performing your skit and like things just don't make sense. You have time to rewrite your skit. So practicing will help the team work out the kinks. Uh, they'll perfect and alter the solution until they get to their first competition and then they go compete. And if they win, great, they get to advance to the next competition. They can change things, right? So if they want to change things between regionals and state or state and world finals, totally fine. Uh, but this is the general process for coming up with a solution in the first place. Uh, the other thing is just to avoid like some stress in your life, because trust me, it can be stressful. Uh, what you want to do is just make sure that there's a deadline way in advance of competition, right? So if competition is, I don't know, March 31st, maybe having everything done by March 15th at the latest, maybe if you're really a go-getter by March 1st, uh, then that gives the team the entire month of March, just practice, 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 and not have to worry about painting last minute things or creating last minute costumes. So just keep that in mind. And it's a teachable moment for the team, right? So that they know when setting their schedule, maybe we shouldn't schedule our props to be finished the night before we're competing, right? Uh, and that's pretty much it in terms of timeline. There are a couple other details when it comes to going to competition as well. So we also have shirts and pins for the team. So at the state level, you want to order state shirts. So Illinois each year has its own shirts. You can go online and look at what that looks like on the Illinois website. This is true of every state, province, and country as well. If you're going from state finals to the world finals, we do a pin trading thing that our friends at Disney actually stole from us one year when we visited them to hold our world finals in Orlando, neither here nor there. Uh, but the idea there is Illinois will have pins that our students can purchase and then trade when they are at world finals. The purpose behind this is for socialization. So it's to help our kids in the program uh, communicate with other students in the program and make new friends from around the world. It's a super cool thing. People love it. Uh, now, the other thing is people aren't required to buy pins, not at all. But we do help coordinate that through the coaches just to make it easier. So instead of having, you can imagine, say you're coaching three teams and have 21 students, that's 42 maybe parents, uh, rather than having communication with 42 different people, we can just coordinate through the coach that's coaching those three teams and it makes it a little bit easier in terms of logistics. So keep that in mind. But again, each state association handles this differently, so just check your website for your association to see how that works. Uh, when it comes to your association competition and world finals, you are the person in charge, right? So uh, you often have, as is always the case in school programs, 
parents who probably mean well, but uh, get in the way. <laughs> Let's just say it's a kind way to say it. Uh, so just make sure in that team contract that we mentioned that maybe that's one of the, the clauses, you know, like at competition, I am in charge or the students will stay with me. So then that way you can kind of keep your team together. You'd be surprised. Uh, usually it goes well, but sometimes, you know, we see the, the tension there. So and we've lived it. Right. So we know that, what that's like. So just be aware that uh, when you are at competition, you are in charge of your team. And just let's make sure that your parents and the students know that as well, because you're the person in charge. Uh, right. So the adults in the room. Ha ha ha. So depending on the age group you're coaching, so if you're a Division three high school team coach, then chances are, I mean, these are high school kids, they're probably able to conduct themselves in a responsible manner and make good use of their time because they are busy and preparing for college and all these other things that, you know, demand their time. So they don't have a lot of time to waste. However, if you were coaching a Division one team of maybe all third graders, they don't know this yet because they're in third grade. So... You are the adult in the room, so you have an a, additional responsibility of, of fostering what I would say is a positive vibe and keeping the team on track. So part of the learning of the program is, yes, the creativity and the STEAM education, totally, but also socialization and teamwork and how to deal with disagreement, all those other things. That's part of the program. It's deliberately built into the program. That's why it's a team-based program and not an individual competition. Uh, so just know that part of your job as the adult in the room is dealing with some of that, right? Uh, so just kind of keep it positive and always approach things as a teachable moment. And I think that's usually uh, the best way, at least when I was coaching, the best way to kind of navigate that whole experience, both with the students and with the parents as well. Uh, the big benefit from this is that I'm still very close with all of my team members from when I was a, a kid. Uh, when my first coach passed away a couple of weeks ago, uh, we were all at the funeral. So like we are people who all keep in touch. So you're really building these valuable lifelong relationships, even if at the time there's tension, that's normal. Uh, and you, you know this just from your own life experience in terms of working with difficult people later, years later, you're like, oh, actually like we can see how we differed now, but maybe we're, we're fast friends or maybe you never speak to them again. It's, you know, totally your business. But point of the story is uh, you do have the additional responsibility of just kind of keeping the peace and fostering the teamwork and socialization of the team members. Nine times out of 10, it goes great every now and then, maybe not, but just be prepared for that. All right, so the other big obligation you have with respect to coordinating the team is paperwork, paperwork, paperwork. So part of competing in the program involves completing paperwork. So when I say paperwork, these are papers that the team must take with them the day of competition. So I've listed a couple of them here. One, the cost form or the materials value form just has the teams list out only those materials that appear in their solution, right? So let me clarify that. If the team bought a bucket of paint, but only used like, I don't know, a spoonful of it to paint a small thing, you don't a lot or account for the whole bucket of paint. You account for just the percentage used that's in the solution, right? So we're talking like quarters, like 50 cents. Like it's cheap. It's not so expensive. Uh, but anything that's in the solution when they're on stage presenting it in those eight minutes must be accounted for in cost. Now this is done for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is to keep the program cheap for participants and for schools. And two, it's to keep things fair, right? Because if we had no cost limit, then teams that came from affluent areas would have flashing lights and extravagant displays, whereas teams that come from maybe not as well off areas uh, just wouldn't be able to afford those resources. So this kind of levels the playing field for everybody. That's why we do it. So that's the materials value or the cost form. The second thing there is a style form. We'll talk about style in just a second, but uh, style is basically the team's own twist on the problem. That's not something that's already asked for in the problem. So it's a chance for the team to kind of show off their talents in a way that wasn't asked for, but that can be judged for points in the problem. So that's what style is. There's a form where they list what their style is, like what they want to be judged on, uh, and that is turned into the judges as well. Some of the problems also have what are called required lists. So sometimes, for example, classics will have the teams, or the classical problem will have teams choose uh, something from history, like a famous person or a famous author, a famous book. And so prior to coming into the room to compete, the team will hand the judges a list that says, we chose you know, this author or this book or this famous person. So that way, when the team comes in, the judges already know what they're looking for. It's a way to actually help the teams so the judges can be prepared, be prepared to score them accordingly, as opposed to like watching the skit and then trying to have to figure it out in the moment. That's more difficult. Uh, and the teams might miss points as a result. So that's the idea of the required list. And then finally, what's called the outside assistance form. I alluded to this earlier. 
The idea of outside assistance in Odyssey of the Mind is that the team should be doing all of the work. And when I say all of the work, I mean all of the work. So if they're building a backdrop, for example, say a Division One team wants to build a backdrop and they want to build an elaborate wood backdrop with screws and hinges and all these things. Uh, if they're miniature carpenters, awesome. Like, go for it, build it. But more often than not, uh, these kids have never used power tools before and they're not allowed near saws for probably good reason. So you probably won't see a division one team with an elaborate wooden backdrop with screws and hinges and nuts and bolts. Probably not gonna happen. Uh, what you might see are division one teams, elementary school teams that have felt backdrops that are held up by poles or something very simple or a curtain rod because that's what they can do at that age, and that's what's expected. Uh, however, you get to Division three, Division four teams, so high school and college, and suddenly that's when we're starting to see elaborate backdrops made of wood and with hinges and fancy additions and even electricity. Uh, so outside assistance is to keep the competition fair. Uh, if we see a Division one team that has like a perfectly designed electrical system with lights and uh, moving pieces and motors, Maybe they did it, and we will give teams the benefit of the doubt. We're not looking to penalize teams, but every now and then you get an overeager parent who just wants to be involved. And really, you can't fault the parents. Every parent wants the best for their child. We get it. But the learning in the program comes from having the students have to develop the solution. And if they can't do the thing that they want because they're not yet to the skill level or experience level to make that happen, then they have to be creative and come up with a different solution that they can do. Uh, so the outside assistance form is basically a form that has the team agreeing and signing their name that nobody, nobody outside of the team members, so no parents, no coach, no anybody, uh, help them come up with their solution, build their solution, or execute their solution in any way. And we take it pretty seriously because, again, it levels the playing field so that every team is competing with only the other teams that they're competing against at the same age level with the same financial resources. That's the idea. Uh, cool. So once you have all those uh, papers and the number of paper, the number of each copy or the copies that you need of each, excuse me, uh, are listed in the problem, right? So you'll know how many you need for each competition. Spoiler alert. You might want to have some extra copies on hand. Uh, that's the next bullet point. Just make multiple copies of all of those forms and have them available the day of competition, right? Keep packets separate in case one gets lost. Uh, just have that paperwork ready to go. Sometimes there are media release forms as well. Uh, those are usually either provided before competition to be turned in at competition, or they're provided once you get to competition. It just depends on the association. That's just basically if your state or the international group takes photos of the team solutions and posts them online, that it's okay that they can use the photos. Of course, if, especially with children, we want to be very respectful of posting pictures of the kids online. Uh, for the most part, this is never a problem. People usually agree, but people have their own reasons not to agree. So just make sure that, you know, you have me to release forms filled out uh, accordingly or indicated that you don't want those pictures posted in the event that you would not want that. Uh, there are also some world final specific paperwork that the coach fills out in terms of more so registration that the team is coming to world finals and that is paperwork that the coach can completely fill out on his or her own the prior forms i was mentioning typically the team is filling those out right uh, i believe that adults can help write it out for the division one teams just because they're you know little ones but your division two three and four teams should be doing this paperwork on their own right again part of the learning as well uh, of course when in doubt about any of this there's a thing called an association director. Uh, that's the person who's kind of the head honcho of Odyssey of the Mind in your particular state, province, or country. Uh, and there's also CCI, which is the main headquarters of the Odyssey of the Mind program. If you are ever in doubt or have any confusion on any of these papers or paperwork, just ask the association director or CCI, and uh, somebody will be able to answer your question, no problem. All right, so we made it through coordinating with the team and keeping them on track. Fantastic. If you're still with me, God bless you. Uh, so let's go to orienting teams to the program, spontaneous style and rules. All right, so I like to say you can't succeed at what you don't know. I get questions all the time, and I just say, hey, did you read the, uh, the program guide? And they're like, program guide? What's that? And then I curl up in the fetal position, and I cry myself to sleep. So let me show you something very quickly. If you go to the main Odyssey of the Mind website, which I have conveniently pulled up right here at odysseyofthemind.com, and scroll all the way down, there's this little thing called the program guide. I'm going to click on it. Ooh, the program guide. Here it comes, slowly and surely. All right, so here's this year's program guide. Uh, there's a table of contents down below. The program guide explains Odyssey of the Mind from A to Z. It has been around for years, and basically reading this is the most helpful, useful thing you will ever do 
ever. Even this presentation, I'm super fond of this presentation, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, but I will tell you that the program guide contains more value than anything at all because it explains from headquarters what the program is all about, how to get started, ways to think about creative problem solving, how to teach divergent thinking. Uh, it gives examples of what counts for cost. Uh, it gives spontaneous problems at the very end that you can practice with your team. So it's a pretty powerful, important document. And I'm telling you, the teams that read the program guide, not just the coach, but the teams that read the program guide or at least go through it, will probably do better because they'll know inside and out what is expected of them, all right? So uh, I can't stress enough how important it is to look over the program guide. If you wanna read every word, even better, but just having some level of familiarity with the program guide is helpful. So that, that way, if you think, oh, like, does this count for cost or not? You can go to the program guide, you know exactly where to look. Teams that never open the program guide have no idea. And what happens is they get to competition and then something goes wrong or they get penalized and they get sad and they're confused when the answer was in the program guide all along, right? So just know the program guide. And the thing is, this is the benefit, if you read it closely at the very first year, guess what? It doesn't change much from year to year. So if you dedicate the time now, the next year when you're, you're coaching, it's gonna be so much easier. And the other nice thing is that headquarters actually highlights the changes made year to year. So all you gotta do is peruse the changes, see if anything drastic has uh, happened, usually it doesn't, and you're good to go. All right, so that's the program guide. When it comes to the components of the program, I mentioned this a bit earlier, there are three main components, long-term, spontaneous, and style. So students should also know how the program works, like what, what each of these things happens to be, where the points are, and the philosophy of each of these components. So uh, your long-term solution is what I like to call the stake. It's the, the main course, if you will. It's where most of your points are, and it should be the focus of the team's attention, right? This is what they will spend from September or January through March or April solving and going into May at World Finals. Uh, that's why it's called long term. See how that works there? So they solve this problem over the long term. Uh, so that's where you're going to dedicate most of your energy. That's where the team will dedicate most of its energy. So in addition to long term is a competition called spontaneous. This would be the side dish or the veggies. This would be the second most important because it has the second highest point value. Uh, and teams can and should practice spontaneous. So let me explain what spontaneous is. Uh, whereas long term, you get the problems in, in September and you can read them and say, okay, here's what's expected of every team and here's what we know we have to do. Here are the limitations. Spontaneous happens the day of competition so the team will leave you so they'll be handed off to a, a judge at competition they will be put into a little room sequestered if you will and then they'll be taken to a separate room where there's a problem waiting for them no one knows what the problem is so you don't get an email in advance there's no uh, advance warning of what the team should expect it's not until the team walks into the room that day of competition that they will discover what the problem is and the problem could be something as simple as name things that are green like Greenland or green grass or someone who's jealous or it could be something as complicated as design a system of communication and communicate to your team members across the room where to put balls in particular buckets that they can't see without talking right uh, so it, it depends no one knows what it's going to be no one knows what's going to have to happen if it'll be verbal it'll be hands-on you won't know until the team goes into the room and then once they leave the room they're not supposed to talk about the problem until technically world finals. Uh, so that's how spontaneous works. It's really to, to get students thinking of how to think on their toes. Uh, and like I said, the good news is you can practice this. There are problems in the, the program guide. So another benefit for reading the program guide. There are free problems online. There are all sorts of resources. You can make up your own spontaneous problems. Uh, and the reason you practice this is that the better teams are thinking on their feet or on the fly, then the more prepared they are to do that exact thing when they walk into a room to solve the new problem. All right, the third piece here, uh, style, is what's called the garnish. So once you've plated your plate, uh, style is a little something extra that the team can do uh, that gives unique flair to their solution. So the thing about style is that it's presented simultaneously with long-term, right? So the long-term solution is presented within an eight-minute period of time, right? So the team is performing for eight minutes in front of the judges and an audience, and style is also presented during this eight minutes, right? So style is usually incorporated into the long-term problem. Now, the trick is, the thing on the bottom here is that style cannot be something that's already being scored in long-term. So if your long-term problem is already scoring something like 
the uh, propulsion system of your vehicle and the vehicle problem. Well, then for style, you can't choose the propulsion system of the vehicle as your style category. It's already being scored, so you can't get double scored. Uh, but let's say your style, you chose uh, the creative design, like the artistic design of the vehicle. Totally fine, because that's not the propulsion system. Uh, so that's the way to think about what style is and how it has to differ from what is already listed in long term for being scored. Uh, the second thing is that teams often don't understand what style is, and it's kind of a problem. Here's my trick for you. Style is anything that the team wants to do that sets it apart that is not currently scored in long term. And typically, the way style works best is when the elements, there's five, four things scored in style, and there's like a fifth overall effect category in the style form, I'll explain. Uh, so two of those style elements are listed in the problem. So let me go back out here real quick, I'll show you. So let's just say we pull up the classics problem, we can go down to where it says style up here, category F. So two of these things are chosen for you. So for this year's classics problem, the teams must use the color red in the presentation, and there must be a creative use of materials in the super villain's costume. And then the team gets to choose two things that it wants to be scored. It could be a music instrument, it could be a backdrop, it could be anything, as long as it's not scored anywhere up here in scoring, then it's fine, right? Now, the last part of style, this fifth category, is the overall effect of the four style elements in the performance. How well these four things work together to create a sense of style for the team solution. So here, if this problem requires the color red, then chances are maybe color could be a fun way to play with style. So maybe we use red throughout everything. Uh, maybe the materials are all materials that have something to do with red. Maybe we play with the word red and we use books, right? So you read this book, you read that book. Uh, maybe there's communism, I don't know, like something using red here. Uh, and then the overall effect is a creative use of red throughout, something like this. So it's completely up to the team of how they make these things fit together. But just think of it in the way of if you heard a Beach Boys song, but you didn't know it was a Beach Boys song, you don't know that it's like one of the popular ones, you probably still know it's a Beach Boys song just by the way it sounds, right? Uh, the same thing, if you see a Picasso that you've never seen before, you might be able to identify it as Picasso because he had a particular style in his artwork. So that's the way to think about style for the team is how do they set themselves apart from every other team that's going to be performing a competition? What theme, what aesthetic approach, what musicality, whatever the case may be, and then integrate that into all of those four elements of style and then summarize it in 0.5 on the style category, right? And that's what you would use on the style form. Remember I mentioned that a couple minutes ago? See how it all comes together? Uh, that would be how they explain it on the style form of here are the four separate things and then the fifth category is how all these things work together to create our unique style. Okay. Uh, orienting teams of the program, budgeting, and fundraising. So Odyssey has a cost limit for each problem. So I said to you, this is what keeps the playing field fair for everyone, regardless of the school's resources. Uh, it also encourages creativity, right? Because if I know I can't spend $200 on a dress uh, for our queen character, now we have to make it out of trash. And it turns out that when you make a dress out of trash, one, it can look really good, and two, uh, it'll be a lot cheaper, right? So $2 instead of $200. Uh, that is great. If you watch Project Runway or shows like that, you'll see people doing this all the time. So it's super encouraging of creativity uh, and it's cool what you see teams coming up with like using trash to make amazing backdrops and sets and things like this uh, you might want to remind the team of their budget from time to time you might even like charge team members the particular amount uh, if the school is not paying for it because then suddenly it's their money and you know they treat it a little more seriously than if it were somebody else's money if the teams advance to world finals, that's where things get a little costly, only because it's expensive to house house a bunch of uh, students and coaches and parents on a college campus for a week and to feed them. But I will say that it's a very affordable approach to having a, an event of its size. So the way it works in Odyssey of the Mind is we hold world finals uh, right now in one of two campuses, so Michigan State University in East Lansing, Michigan, or Iowa State University in Ames, Iowa. The reason we go to these places are, is that they're the only school big enough to host 15,000 people coming to campus. So we always have to be at a Division I school just because we need a campus of that size to accommodate uh, by way of dorms and residence colleges and food and all these things. So 
Uh, but it's also super fun because it gives the students an opportunity to experience life sort of as a college student. So they get that taste of what it's like to live on a college campus at a young age. I remember my first world finals and it's so cool because you're staying at a university and it creates a really cool community element as well when you have teams from around the world hanging out together on this college campus. And it's just out of save the mind because it's in between sessions for classes. So it's really just Omer's from around the world. Omers, by the way, is what we call out of semi participants. So I should have clarified that. Uh, so don't panic, however, because uh, one, if you're listening to this in Illinois, it's super easy to get to Iowa and to Michigan. It used to be that World Finals was sometimes held in Maryland or Colorado, and it was much more expensive. For us, it's actually pretty great. You can take the train, you can fly, you can drive. Uh, whereas the poor teams from California or Germany or Japan, a little more expensive for those teams. So it's actually cool for us. Sorry if you're listening to this from somewhere other than Illinois, by the way. We love you too. Uh, but what most teams do is they just start fundraising early, even if they know that they're not well, they don't know that they're going to world finals yet. Uh, usually they can fundraise, keep the money in an account, and then if they go, the money is there and ready to happen. Uh, a lot of schools will help pay for world finals, and we also give grants. I'm on a board at the international level. We try to give grants to new schools or new teams that are going to world finals for the first time. You just have to apply for them because, again, our goal is to get as many students to world finals as possible. We don't want costs to be the reason they can't participate. So we keep the cost as low as possible, uh, but it still costs money to, to house people and to pay for the food. Now, the nice thing is once you're there, your housing is paid for, there's towels, like towel service, all that's paid for, of course, with the showers and stuff in the dorms, and they're not bad. So don't panic when you think, oh gosh, dorm living, they're fine, they're nice. Uh, and two, you get to eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day. Uh, and the food is typically pretty good. It's something we make sure of. So just don't worry that once you're there, the nice thing is the expenses are no extra expenses. Like your life is paid for for that week while you're there, which is nice. Uh, cool. You might also want to let the parents know the potential costs up front so they can help fundraise and generate ideas for how to create money throughout the year. Maybe that's their contribution. Uh, some people sometimes just write a check. It's a nonprofit because you can write it to uh, Odyssey of the Mind in your state, I believe. Uh, but in any case, the way it works when you pay for Odyssey is it can be tax deductible. You just have to you know, make sure you have the right information and get confirmation for that once you pay. But some parents just prefer to pay like write a check and just pay for their kid to go because it's tax deductible as a school affiliated cost. So keep that in mind. Uh, the other thing that's really nice is because it is tax deductible through your state or through your school or whatever organization, if it's a nonprofit organization hosting, then companies will sponsor and it'll be a nice tax write-off for them. So there's a benefit for them, but they also feel good because they're helping these kids have the opportunity to go to world finals. So that's something to think about as well. So let's see, taskmaster and rule follower. Now you are permitted to remind the teams of the program rules, right? So if they're doing something that like is either in violation of the rule or it's like a, you know, they have a substance like a battery or something that's not permitted by the rules in the program guide, it is totally fine for you to say like, hey, no, you can't do that. It's in the program guide. Uh, rather than have them get to competition and be like, well, I didn't know if I could tell them because I was their coach and outside assistants. No, like in that case, you could just be like, no guys, like that's not allowed. Uh, the other thing is as an educator, mentor, parental figure, it is totally fine for you to remind them to get their work done. You just can't tell them what to do, right? So if they're like, you know, just messing around, not getting anything done, it's okay to keep them on task. You just can't say, you know, Joey, you need to go paint that thing blue. And Amanda, you need to go like uh, add this joke to the skit, right? Uh, if Amanda should be writing the skit, you can say, Amanda, go write the skit. If Joey should be working on props, you can say, Joey, go work on props. That's totally fine. Uh, you just can't help them solve the problem itself, right? All right, so far so good. We're about halfway there. I know this is a long presentation, but I hope it's changing your life for the better. Uh, so number three, asking the right questions of the team. So here's the big thing. Part of learning in Odyssey is knowing where the points are. So I, I point this out to new coaches because it's something that so many overlook. This is that thing I was telling you about the tips and tricks from a long time Omer. Here's my inside scoop. Uh, if you think about life and your job, at work, whatever, you are often evaluated using formal rubrics that have particular numbers that a manager is looking at when they're deciding if you get a bonus or, you know, whatever consequence happens at your place of employment. Guess what? The same thing is true in Odyssey of the Mind, right? So the judges and officials have rubrics that are given to the team. That's the important thing. So let's go back out. I just want to remind you again why this is so important. If you look right here, section D, so here is classics, we go to section D. D, 
It's scoring. Oh boy. Uh, let's go to problem four, the structural problem. Same thing. Let's go down here to section D. <gasps> it's scoring. And if we look over here, we see how many points the team is able to get with respect to their problem. So if we're looking at the classics problem, you can see here, let's just go down the side here, uh, 30 points, up to 30 points for this detective character. Wow, that's a lot of points, right? Out of the uh, 200. Um, down here, the set changes, but you only get up to 15 points for that. So it's not, you know, completely negligible, but it's not 30 points. You get twice as many points for the performance of this detective character based on these factors here. Then you do this set changing. So if we're spending time solving the problem, this should probably get at least twice as much attention as this guy down here, right? How much the set changes. They both should get the team's attention, but help your team direct itself to where the points are. Uh, I see too often when I'm at World Finals and we're judging, a team will spend, will have spent so much time on something that did not even matter or did not get a lot of points. And maybe people get the full points for that, which is great, I guess. But in terms of helping them win the competition, it's not, not going to help them. So part of the learning is, okay, what are we being evaluated on? And how do we direct our attention and our resources and our creativity to those elements, right? And think about it, as a coach, what you're doing is you're preparing them for, hey, when you go away to university and you're in class and the group project is worth 70% of your grade and this other assignment is worth 5% of your grade, make sure you're spending more time on the group project as opposed to the assignment. Yes, get the assignment done, but know how to allocate your time and your limited resources uh, when it comes to prioritization, right? Uh, same thing for a job, right? If you are in a job and you get evaluated, you know, your evaluation is 60% of one thing and like 20% of something else and then you know smaller percentages that make up to 100 the thing that's worth 60% should get the majority of your attention and your time right so you're teaching them a valuable lesson here and what's nice is without solving the problem for them you're directing them to what they need to focus on to solve the problem as well as they possibly can so uh, just Keep that in mind. It's something that coaches often overlook and teams certainly overlook because they're not thinking about this. They're focusing on things that are fun or cool. But if those things don't actually address what is scored, no matter how cool or fun those specific elements are, they're not going to win a competition because that's not the rubric that the judges have in front of them. Right. So just keep that in mind. Uh, the second thing here is how do you ask the right questions with respect to scoring? So. One way to do that is say, hey, do you think this idea satisfies the scoring requirement as outlined in the problem? That directs their attention to that section D in the problem, which is good. Uh, is this element the best it can possibly be with respect to what the problem is looking for? That's a simple, fair question to ask. Maybe they'll say yes, and you got to go with it. Uh, or maybe they'll say, you know what, maybe it's not. Maybe we can do X, Y, or Z, and that's great. Or you might ask, how can you potentially improve this element to ensure you will obtain maximum points? So again, you are not directing them. You're not saying, here's how you solve the problem, or here's what you must do. You're just challenging them to think a bit harder about if they're being as creative as possible. So that is a great way to coach as you uh, coach in Odyssey of the Mind. All right, so a brief aside. Uh, Points are awesome, right? Because if you want to win, that's how you win. But we also believe in Odyssey that winning a competition isn't really the goal. In fact, the reason it's called Odyssey of the Mind is that we believe the journey is what matters more than anything else. Uh, and because of that, we actually reward creative solutions that might not work. They might have been a little too risky and the risk didn't pay off. Uh, so we reward that risk-taking and that exceptional creativity, right? Because you can play it safe and come up with a pretty good solution and win, uh, but then sometimes the leaps of faith, the, uh, the ultimate in risk in terms of uh, ideas, can be more creative but sometimes just don't pan out because they were so risky. So for that, we have an award called the Renat Refusco Award. So a Renat Refusco Award is a, uh, an award given to a team that came up with an extremely creative, like just off the wall, no one would ever think of that solution that maybe didn't work, right? So maybe it was such a risk, a risky technical device, a risky solution in terms of the approach they took for performance uh, that it just didn't pan out in terms of the points, uh, in terms of the rubric but we can award that exceptional creativity with a Renatra Fusca. The cool thing about Renatra Fusca is that at the state level or the association level, often getting Renatra Fusca, Fusca can uh, advance you to world finals. Not always, but uh, some states have it so that that's a possibility. And then of course at world finals, if you get a Renatra Fusca, your name goes on this cool, huge trophy that is stored at, I think one of the Smith Smithsonian museums, something like this, it's, it's stored somewhere. Uh, so you would become one of the the few teams over the past you know four decades that have had 
that opportunity to have your name etched on that trophy. So it just highlights how, yes, you know, knowing how to follow rules and uh, get points and pay attention to the rubric, that is important and that is part of winning the competition and that is a skill that is valuable for life. Uh, but we also value exceptional risk-taking and creativity and we reward that. We don't want you to think that you just must follow the rules all the time. Uh, you can do both, of course. You can do both follow the rules and take risks. But uh, in the event that you take a risk and it doesn't pay off, there is a way to reward that honesty of the mind and that is the Renatra Fusco award. Uh, the last thing here, oftentimes people do this creative problem solving program and they don't even know what creativity is. So just so you know, creativity from an academic perspective, so people who have spent their lives studying creativity at universities, they would say that creativity incorporates two sort of broad constructs. One is novelty and the second is appropriateness. So what do we mean by that? We'll break it down into these four factors here. So you want something that is original, unique, useful, and effective. So the big way of thinking about this is that a creative idea isn't just original. It's not just something you haven't seen before. It's something you might not have seen before that no one else can really imitate that also gets the job done. And that's the important part, that last piece, because anybody can come up with off the wall things. And if you don't believe me, go see what Kanye West is doing today, or sometimes Lady Gaga is doing today. These are people who are super artistic and that's wonderful. Uh, but oftentimes, their creativity doesn't really translate into practicality. It doesn't get the job done. Um, so just think about the difference between being unique and original for the sake of being unique and original versus what creativity would suggest is being unique and original but still getting the job done effectively. Like those two things must happen. It must be unique, novel, but also appropriate and functional. That's creativity. That's the way we think about it at an academic perspective or from an academic perspective. So you might be asking, all right, if I'm a coach, am I supposed to just be a glorified babysitter? And the answer is absolutely not, right? Even though you can actually solve the problem for the team, uh, you can help them by providing resources or introducing them to experts who can give them general tips on certain categories of information. So for example, say you know an artist or an architect, an auto mechanic or a musician, you can have them come and talk to the team, uh, talk about acting skills, talk about uh, the structure of a song, that's fine. That's totally fine and that's encouraged in Odyssey of the Mind because we want the students to have exposure to these people and uh, their expertise. Like that's part of the learning outside of the traditional classroom that Odyssey embraces. Uh, but what can happen is you and these experts aren't allowed to actually solve the problem or any of its requirements itself. So say, for example, uh, this year's technical problem requires teams, I think, to write a song. So you have a musician come and speak to the team members about elements of good songwriting, right? So the structure of a song, so you have your introduction, your verses, your chorus, and your bridge. Uh, talk about you know chord progressions, things that when you're writing a song, would be helpful to know. Uh, this is fine. It's general education about music and artistry and song structure. That's totally okay. Uh, but what they can't do is they can't help the team write the lyrics. They can't help compose the music. Like that's a no-no. The team has to do all that on their own. Same thing. Say you have somebody, a comedy writer, come in and talk about uh, five-point scene structure in a comedy scene. Great, that's general information that is provided. You could read it in a book, you could find it online. It just so happens that this comedy writer is telling them how a five point scene structure works. Cool, what they can't do is write the skit. They can't tell jokes that then the team uses to solve the problem. The team has to do that. So general knowledge is totally fine. Uh, and here are some okay, not okay examples, right? So an architect talking about shapes and their relative strength, totally okay. Not okay is the architect actually drawing up a structure idea for the structural problem, for example. Uh, it's okay for an actor to come in and talk about good stage presence, uh, perform performing practices and discussing general sketch structure or even engaging in like acting exercises. What's not okay is if the actor starts writing the script or making suggestions for ideas to include in the, the sketch. Uh, also okay is a team member showing parents how to use a machine saw safely and properly, right? So teaching them how to cut on a you know, piece of wood that's not involved in the solution. So then what's not okay is if the parent actually cuts the piece of wood or uses anything to like build something that would then go in the team solution, right? So uh, again, as I said earlier, if the teams can't do something themselves, then they need to find a different way, a different solution for that particular element of the problem. So you can and should be this educator and mentor whenever possible. That is one of the most rewarding aspects of being a coach, right? You're teaching them to fish. Uh, so 
that's the idea of your role in terms of educating and mentoring these students. You're not just a passive observer. You can't solve the problem itself, but you can guide them to resources that will help them solve the problem. That's totally okay. Uh, when it comes to training for spontaneous, I mentioned this earlier that spontaneous is designed to be a surprise, but you can and should practice for it. You can buy books online at the Odyssey of the Mind website, but there's also a ton of free resources online as well. Uh, you might want to break down what is meant by verbal, nonverbal, and hands-on for spontaneous problems? Because when they walk into the room that day, before they have to decide which five of them are solving the problem, side note, only five students can participate in spontaneous. Uh, all seven team members can be in the room, but only five can do it. The judges will tell them it's either a verbal problem, a nonverbal problem, or a hands-on spontaneous problem. Verbal means they're going to be using words, right? So it's either uh, replying, responding to a question or creating play. Uh, nonverbal, clearly words aren't involved or don't matter. Maybe they're not communicating using uh, spoken or written language. And hands-on means that they're going to be building something, right? They're going to be using their hands in some way to create or um, engage with some some things that the judge provide for them, right? So trinkets to make music, whatever the case may be, just know that you're going to be touching and doing stuff. So that's the idea of verbal, nonverbal, and hands-on. The team can decide from there which of the five team, five team members will participate in the problem. And the reason for this is that some students' strengths are to be very verbal and can be quick-witted in terms of thinking and saying things out loud, uh, whereas others are super structural, right? They can build things. They're very good at coming up with things on the fly, uh, touching things, that's their style. So uh, it just helps the team kind of play to their own strengths. So uh, the other thing is that students should be comfortable completing any type of spontaneous problem because you never know what you're going to get. So you could be getting a, uh, a verbal problem at regionals or states and a hands-on problem at world finals. You just never know. The key to being successful at spontaneous problems is being familiar with how it works, right? So if you look in the program guide and read through the instructions on each of the sample spontaneous problems, the way it's set up there is the way it will unfold at competition. So the more that teams have been exposed to that structure in terms of even just the, the format where the judges are saying, you know, your team has one minute to think and two minutes to respond. Your question is this. Common responses will get this many points. Creative responses will get this many points. The day of competition when they walk in the room, the problem will be different, but that those lines of your team has one minute to think, two minutes to respond. Your question is this. You have, you know, where common responses get so many points. Creative responses get this many points. All that will be the same. So uh, the more rehearsed the team can be in terms of the structure of spontaneous, the better off they'll be. That's one of those tips and tricks that people don't think about. So something else I want to point out here is that teamwork is often a scored element of spontaneous. This is very much the case for the hands-on problems where the team is working together to build a structure or to create a communication device, whatever the case may be. Uh, the team has to work together and the judges are watching how well they work together. I have been in the room, unfortunately, where teams start yelling at each other <laughs> and it's not great. Uh, this happens in the real world, right? People have disagreements with their colleagues uh, all the time. Uh, but what we're trying to teach in Odyssey is how to work together under pressure with a group of people who may have different solutions to the same problem. That happens a lot in real life. So uh, what we're trying to advocate is, okay, cool. How do you then deal with that? How do you deal with, you know, five people having different, five different solutions, uh, but have to work together to come up with one in a time crunch? So, you know, for the most part, teams do work well together, but under pressure, it can get a little, you know, a little dicey. So uh, just work with your teams and remind them that oftentimes the judges are watching not just how they're solving the problem or, you know, specifically to the problem itself, but how they're working together as a team because uh, they are, and sometimes that is scored. It's usually mentioned, right? So if the, the problem is scoring the team on how well they work together, that will be mentioned as the problem is being read aloud to the team. Uh, but frankly, it's just good to practice anyway, because again, it's a skill that we try to teach in Odyssey of how to work well with others, particularly when you're under pressure and have all these requirements uh, and everybody has good ideas. So at the bottom it says, is it okay for you to judge solutions in spontaneous? Yeah, of course. You're not helping them solve a problem. It's not like you're contributing to the solution in long term. Here you're just helping them practice the skill of thinking quickly on their feet, which will prepare them for spontaneous the day of competition. And you're, there's no way of knowing what problem they'll have at competition. So uh, you're not giving them solutions for that in particular. So in this case, it's not outside assistance. Uh, Remember, you're there just to tell them, though, that you thought the answer was creative or common as a subjective judge. It's subjective, so a different judge may say something else, and that's important to point out to them, right? Because they may be offended that you didn't think their answer was creative. Maybe somebody else will. That's just your take. Uh, but the day of competition, you never know, right? That judge is going to think something is creative or common based on his or her own life experiences, and that's, that's that. 
But a good question to ask, I say the right question to ask is, uh, after the team has given its solution, you can ask them, well, how could your responses have been more creative? Or how could this device you built have been more creative or more effectively done the job? So that's a great question to ask, not just in spontaneous, but also in long term, because what it does is it actually forces the team to think about how they could be more creative. So you're not telling them what they should do. They're coming up with those solutions themselves and learning and the process of doing it. All right, so now we're on to communicating with parents, the school, Odyssey of the Mind, etc. cetera. Uh, I said this at the very beginning, explaining Odyssey of the Mind is not easy. We're probably well into an hour now of talking about coaching. Uh, Odyssey of the Mind is not easy to explain because it's a very comprehensive, involved program that I say is easier to experience than to explain. And in fact, it's better to experience than to explain. It's super fun. Uh, it's a lot of work, yes, but the team members learn so much and they're having such a good time doing it that they don't even realize they're learning. And that's the best kind of learning. Uh, the short version is to tell people, Odyssey the Mind is a creative problem solving program for teams of students. It's pretty much that. It's not even necessarily a school program because community groups can do it themselves. Uh, the other thing is the more you communicate and get parent or school support up front, the better your life is going to be. Because if you find that you're the only person that cares, you're the only parent, if you're a coach and a parent that's showing up, uh, it's going to feel like you're putting in all the effort and no one else is there to help you. And that's not great, right? So what you want to try to do is find other parents who maybe can sit in sometimes if you have other things in your life going on so that the team can keep moving forward, even if you can't make it a particular week, right? Or at least if they can't do that, that you'll know up front so then that way you kind of know how to balance your schedule so then that way you can be there for the team or you know have some time for yourself as well so the more you communicate this up front, the better off you're going to be. The same thing, if you know that the school is going to pay for a membership or your local community organization will pay for that membership or that they have money set aside for World Finals to help you do that, again, that just helps you kind of know what you need to do to adjust to prepare for those things going forward. Uh, what you don't want to do is wait to the last minute and then ask the school for money for World Finals and they're like, oh, sorry, no, you should have asked us in October because that's not great. Uh, parents can be your best resources and allies or your worst nightmare. And this is true. Of course, we think of like soccer mom, soccer dad. Uh, most parents that I've experienced in the Addis of the Men program all want the same thing. They want the best for their kids. Uh, they want them to be doing a program that is teaching them life-changing skills. And Odyssey will do that. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, not every parent sees things the same way. That's fine. That's expected. And you're going to run into that no matter what school program you do. But that's where communicating up front, having those team contracts will help really minimize any negativity. Uh, and it always gives you something to go back to. If a parent's like, well, I didn't know my kid was going to have to miss, you know, or you know, spend the whole weekend working on this problem, uh, you can say, well, you did because you signed this paper that said so. So again, this rarely happens, but it's just wise to do up front just to, you know, cover your bases. Uh, the other thing is to just let parents know the financial obligations related to the program. And this varies from school to school, community to community. Uh, if it's possible that you guys can fundraise as a team, great. Um, just kind of give a heads up for so that parents know they're not surprised that when, you know, World Finals comes around and there's this, yeah, a couple hundred dollars that they need to pay for their kid that they're not panicking or if they know it's going to cost that much and you offer volunteer fundraising opportunities you know between october or september and may that they'll show up because they'll know if they don't show up that then they're going to be on the line for that much money if you know you advance to world finals and i don't know what parent wants to tell their kid they can't go to world finals because they messed up and didn't fundraise or you know didn't pay attention so again just keep that in mind the other thing that's super important when it comes to communicating with parents, they must underscore, must understand what outside assistance is. Uh, every part of the team solution, the ideas, the actual tangible items, the costumes, the backdrops, the props, must come from the members of the team. Parents are not allowed to build, design, suggest, or create any part of the team solution. Even at competition, if there's like duct tape coming off of a backdrop, the parents are not allowed to touch it. If a judge sees it, they're probably not going to give them an outside assistance penalty, but they'll say something. They'll say, hey, don't, you know, don't forget, like it's only the teams can solve. We'll be nice about it. But uh, the, again, the idea is that the, the students are the ones that are contributing the solution from point A to point Z, the entire experience in the program. Uh, and again, that keeps the playing field fair to make sure that students aren't, or that parents aren't doing uh, the work of students. So that way, again, a seven-year-old is competing with only other seven-year-olds and not a 47-year-old. 
And the other thing is that if you have parents doing the solution or if you're doing the solution, you're taking away from the opportunity for those students to learn and that defeats the purpose of the program. So it's a good reason we have this rule. It can be frustrating because you just, you can see a solution and you know, the team can't see, you just want to do it for them. But it's like basically kicking the soccer ball into the goal for them. What, what does that do for the student? They don't learn how to play the game, right? Uh, so I say at the end, it's just important to include that in the team contract just so that it's clear uh, that parents should not be solving the problem. When it comes to working with your school or community group, uh, it's typically the case that schools will sponsor out of see the mind. They will buy the membership more often than not. Uh, and usually schools will provide resources like meeting rooms, uh, some money in terms of like buying the materials with, you know, you can only spend up to like 130 bucks. So it's not crazy. Each problem specifies how much money you're allowed to spend. However, big however, not all schools are equally as supportive. But that's okay because we know that that's the case. We know some schools are, are, are more able to provide these resources than others, and that's fine. Uh, it, to get around it, basically, community groups can also sponsor a team, right? So the local library, a local Lions Club can sponsor a team, and they can do that just by letting the team use their name if the school won't let the, the team use its name. Uh, they can pay for the membership if they want. They don't have to, right? They can just lend their name, and then like the, the team will pay for the membership. Uh, or they can do both. Totally fine. Uh, the rule, the only rule there is that the community group can't be set up just for Odyssey of the Mind. So you can't just be like, oh, we're going to create like a new Odyssey of the Mind of Springfield and like start your thing. No, like it's got to be an existing group. And that's just to prevent schools from sort of circumventing or like, you know, creating their own own group to compete against other schools. It's a, a dodgy thing. So the idea there is that most schools will sponsor the Odyssey of the Mind program either financially or they'll let the team use its name even if they're not paying for it. And if they don't, then just use an existing community group uh, to get started. You can also just buy a membership, right? Like it's totally fine to buy a membership on your own and then leverage the school's name or community group's name as your, uh, your official sponsoring member, if that makes sense. Even if you as a parent or a group of parents are paying for it, that's totally fine. It's often best to have an ally at the school or within the community group. So if you know, you're know you a coach and you're a parent or a teacher, having a principal on board or some administrator on board is usually helpful just to get support for the program. That helps with recruiting new students, volunteers, um, you know, just getting support for the program. Fundraising is helpful in that capacity as well. So uh, just be aware of, of the power brokers in your district and think about how you can reach out to them for their support. The easiest way to do that is to point out that Odyssey of the Mind has been around since 1978. It's got you know now over 40 years of experience, and colleges love it, right? Uh, people who have done Odyssey of the Mind will hire other people who have done Odyssey of the Mind because they know the sort of skills that are acquired as a part of the program. So the other benefit is we have an alumni program now that we started a couple of years ago that's over 40 years worth of alumni in positions like all over the place, celebrities, um, business leaders. So it's now, it sort of operates like a university alumni group. So there's a, a big valuable network of people who have done this program who realize all the expertise and all the, the dedication that you get from and put into the program. So just know it's super valuable. People like it. And it's uh, it's got a positive reputation globally, right? Because it's in over 30 countries around the world. So that's usually enough to convince people. And if not, then there's probably no convincing them. Uh, yeah, so that is helpful. And the other thing is to maybe show them a video because, again, trying to explain Odyssey can be a little difficult. Uh, when it comes to working with your Odyssey officials locally and internationally, know who your association director is. Go to your website, so IllinoisOdyssey.org, and see who's running the program near you. Know how to access them should you have any questions. Usually that's just through that state website or association website. Uh, also note, and this is pretty important, that most associations require each team to provide a volunteer for competition day. Uh, that helps ensure staffing and fairness. So think this through. In Illinois, we have teams... Uh, throughout the state, so Chicago, Peoria, Belleville, Carbondale, uh, Urbana-Champaign, if our volunteers only came from Chicago and you have teams from Peoria, Belleville, Carbondale, Champaign uh, coming to Chicago and the Chicago teams win, then you're thinking, oh, well, of course, all the judges are from Chicago. So instead, if our judges come from Peoria and Chicago and Belleville and Carbondale and Urbana-Champaign, then that ensures fairness across the board for all of our teams. We design our judging teams to be representative of the teams and where they're from themselves so that there's no bias, uh, either, even implicit bias, when it comes to judging the teams. And the other thing is that we're all volunteers. I'm a volunteer. The association director is a volunteer. We are volunteering our time. Uh, and in order to have enough judges to judge each problem in each competition, we need to have 
volunteers. So that's what we ask our teams to provide a volunteer. Uh, usually it's not a good idea to have a parent be a volunteer because they're going to want to see their child compete. Uh, and even though we've tried to make exceptions for that in the past, it's very difficult to schedule a competition where that is totally possible. So find a friend, find a relative who doesn't have a child competing in the program, a fellow teacher, if you're a teacher, uh, somebody who's done the program before and just wants to come back. We promise we make it fun for them. And now judge training, just like coach training, is completely online. So they just have to give the one Saturday for competition. It used to be they had to come in for two Saturdays, one for training and the other for competition. Uh, that's no longer uh, necessary. They can do the judge training online. So it's pretty, pretty easy and it feels good. It's rewarding to volunteer in that way. Uh, cool. The last thing is just remember that everyone running the tournament is volunteers, right? Every single person. So we need help. Uh, that's like any volunteer organization. We need people that are willing to give their time and uh, energy for these kids. And like I said, it's it would be one thing if we were like, I don't know, cleaning up litter on the side of the street, which is valuable and fun. Uh, but this is a lot more engaging than that. And it's basically free entertainment from young people. And how can you beat that? So uh, last piece here is hands off the solution. So this is that piece called outside assistance. I've already mentioned it. But as I said, Odyssey of the Mind is called Odyssey for a reason. The students learn along the way. If we, the adults, the coaches, volunteers, anybody is doing the work for them, then it completely defeats the purpose of the program. Uh, also, it would eliminate the fair playing field for competition. So then that way, if a 40-year-old is designing the backdrop for a Division I elementary school team, other elementary school teams and that problem competing against that team are going to be at a disadvantage because they did not create such an elaborate backdrop. So if the team can't solve the problem without getting help, they need to find a new solution, right? Part of Odyssey is it's divergent thinking. There's no one right way to solve the problem that is presented. So if they can't build a particular solution because they're too young and they don't have the expertise, uh, then they find something that they can do, right? So even if a problem requires you to write a song, Awesome. High school kids are going to write a song that you could hear on the radio. Uh, grade school kids are probably going to like beat on some cardboard boxes, and maybe some of them have instrument ex ex instrumental experience uh, at a very early amateurish level. That's fine. That's what's expected at Division One, right? We're not expecting a Billboard number one hit for Division One teams. So just keep that in mind uh, as the teams are solving the problem. Uh, this learning component of the program is actually super, super important, and we take it very seriously. Uh, we never, ever, ever, ever want to punish teams. We never want to penalize them. That is not fun for judges. Uh, but when it comes to outside assistance, if it's clearly evident that outside assistance has taken place, we have no choice but to provide a penalty because it has to keep the playing field fair for all the teams. So we're not doing it to punish the kids. That's not the goal. And that's the frustrating part of outside assistance is sometimes it's not even the kids. It's technically not the kids that have caused the problem, uh, but we have to keep the competition fair. So the best solution there is just make sure every part of the, the team solution is done by the team members only. Uh, and the other thing here is it's not really just a it's not a burden. It's actually a, a huge relief for you. Uh, you don't have to do anything, right? In terms of solving the problem or painting or coming up with a creative idea, uh, the students actually solve the problem, right? So I say here, oftentimes you will see an obvious solution the teams don't see, but if you tell them what to do, then you've completely eliminated that discovery of the ideation process, which it's actually, trust me, a lot more fun to watch that light bulb go off over the head and see them come up with a really cool solution than for you to tell them the solution yourself. I promise you, it's much more valuable than even just like getting it done. Uh, so that's super important. When you watch teams win with outside assistance, you know that they won doing all the work and that again, feels super rewarding. Lastly, as I said, outside assistance relieves any stress or pressure off of you. It's not your job to write the skit. It's not your job to build the vehicle. It's the team's job. If they don't do it in time for competition, they don't do it in time for competition. That's on them. That's not really on you. Uh, but hopefully you can guide them along that they will. But just keep in mind, like the students have a job to do. You're there to like keep them on the right track, but they have to do the work. Uh, so just know that. So that's it. Uh, that's kind of the, the cool things about being a coach, the expectations that you have. If you have any questions, you can let me know. You can email me at jim.il.odyssey at gmail or uh, contact at illinoisodyssey.org. I'll check both. So one other thing I wanted to point out is uh, a resource that I made for Illinois teams and specifically Illinois coaches that I will share with you if you would like it. So it's a how to do Odyssey of the Mind in Illinois guide. Uh, and it explains not just what Odyssey of the Mind is, but how to get started, the three components, also a 10-week method. So giving yourself 10 weeks to start from scratch to getting a solution up and running for your team. 
Uh, and then just some specifics related to Illinois. So the state competition and timeline, what to expect the day of competition, uh, how shirts and pins work in Illinois specifically, fundraising ideas, um, all that's in this PDF document and it's actually pretty handy. Uh, I didn't wanna give teams more to read than they had to. This is specifically for coaches, this particular document. Uh, if you read the program guide, you'll get a lot of this stuff in there. This is kind of a different way of explaining it. And then I think the important thing that this provides that the uh, program guide does not is the how to get started. So creating your teams, uh, and then also solving the problem kind of within 10 weeks. So what week one looks like, what week two looks like, and so on. So again, you don't have to follow this uh, you know, from A to Z, but uh, it can provide some ideas to what you should be doing and how you can coordinate each meeting. So uh, specifically week one, talking about what kind of things you want to be thinking about in your first week, what kind of things you want to think about in week two. So again, if you're a first time coach and you're thinking, oh, I can't do this, I don't know where to get started, don't worry, I got you covered. So if you need this access to this, if you don't have it already, just uh, send me an email at the email addresses I, I mentioned to you, and I'm happy to provide this resource for you so then that way you feel great about uh, getting your team up and running in Illinois Odyssey and in Odyssey of the Mind in general. Uh, and finally, I just wanna thank you. Uh, Odyssey of the Mind, as I said, is a volunteer program. I volunteer, the judges volunteer, our coaches volunteer, and we know this, and we know we're all busy people. Our schedules only get busier. Uh, and a lot of times you are in a position where you are spending a lot of time with these students and helping them solve a problem. And uh, you might wonder, okay, what's the benefit? What's the benefit? And I can tell you as somebody who's done the program, you know, I competed for 10 years and I've been judging for a lot longer. Uh, it changes people's lives, right? And you might not see it necessarily in a particular moment or a particular day. Uh, but by the end of the year, you'll see how students have changed in the program. And if they keep with it and they stay with the program, and even yourself, you'll see that you have changed as a person and these students have changed forever. I'll end with, uh, I think, what, one of the most compelling pieces of evidence for Odyssey of the Mind. Uh, my team members from when I was a child all wound up in jobs that are related to what they did in Odyssey of the Mind, right? So my friend Maureen used to build our structures and we did the structural problem and now she's an architect. Uh, my friend Ben and I used to write the sketches. Uh, I work in marketing as a professor. Ben works in marketing uh, for luxury companies. He was at Louis Vuitton for many years in Paris. Now he's based in London. Uh, my friend Brandy was our fashion expert and now guess what? She works in fashion. So uh, it, it's remarkable how the skills that you know, you learn at Odyssey of the Mind translate into what you do for the rest of your life and how it changes how you relate to people and work as a team uh, and knowing what's demanded of the job market. I'm a professor. I see this every day with my students at university. I can tell you there is no other program that is going to better prepare students for the future than this program. And for you to be the coach and to have any small part of changing lives in this way, I promise you it's going to be a valuable experience, even with any costs that come with it, right? The, the long nights, uh, you know, the sleepless, the sleepless days that you have after meeting so often, the stress that you have preparing for competition, all of that uh, will pale in comparison to the joy that you have from seeing these students grow and from accomplishing this for yourself. So if you have any questions, let me know. Hopefully this has been useful and uh, best of luck. Hope to see you at competition.